I'm like, see, faculty care too. Um, so we define sustainability. Let's just write this down again so that you have it. Sustainability. Uh, you have a definition already. It's using resources in a way that allows later generations a better or equal quality of life. Right? That's a real short way to say it. You already have it written down. If you already have it written, don't like shorten it to this. But really, responsibly using what you have. We have a whole bunch of resources on Earth that we're going to talk about. We don't want to run out of resources because then we don't use those anymore. Like Life sucks if you can't use your resources. Cool. Um, so using resources responsibly. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, what we're at now, because climate is already changing, like it's it's not too late, but it's depressingly like approaching the the uh, yeah we didn't do this very well point. So uh, in addition to sustainability, what we also do is resilience. And so a lot of the the plans that I'll talk about, a lot of the things that different countries or cities or counties are doing end up being resiliency goals rather than sustainability things. Resilience, again, is uh, minimizing or mitigating, if you want, the negative consequences or negative effects of climate change. So I talked about all those things, all those effects of climate change. Sea level rise, glaciers melt, water uh, insecurity, other. Resilience is adapting to those things and realizing, okay, this stuff is happening. How do we make it so that we're more comfortable and less people die? That's resilience. So the uh, I divide this into six different aspects, which ends up being kind of like all of your life and everything on Earth can have some sustainability or resilience aspect to it. The first one, and uh, the one that I deem the most important, is economic sustainability or resilience. Economic. This is a good thing because three quarters of you are business majors. So this means that, oh, now you have to do your number one on this list of people that have to do stuff. Cool. Uh, that's also your number one on this list of people who can get jobs in this field. That's good. All right, so economic sustainability. Um, this applies in a couple different ways. But uh, stopping climate change and changing the way that we act to minimize the damage of climate change costs money. Uh, a lot of people say it's expensive, but it's actually not expensive when you consider like other costs, um, which we'll get into today. Uh, but all the things that I'm going to talk about, where there's... Uh, that's where this stopped. Oh, no, it's because uh, All things that we're going to talk about have to either make money or save money in order to be viable. Uh, any sustainable, resilient, environmentally friendly, eco-friendly, all, like all those buzzwords, have to be uh, economically viable. They must make or save money. So if you have some option like, hey, we're going to recycle stuff. In order for people to really do it, to get people to really recycle, uh, you've got to make money or save money. Now, recycling, we're going to talk about, isn't all that effective. The much more effective thing than recycling is just not creating waste. But that's kind of hard to make like money out of not buying stuff. How do you, how do you make that into an economically sexy thing? <laughs> Buy less. That's not... Well, it's economical for us. So all these ideas that we talked about, 
Uh, if it's going to work, they have to make money or save money. Uh, one example that I have is uh, from a CSU campus uh, that was starting their uh, different sustainability projects. So you might transfer to a CSU. This is one way that they would, would be more sustainable and make money doing it. Was they, they had to build a parking structure. Parking is a big problem on most campuses. Um, and so in that parking structure, they installed uh, LED lights. And those LED lights were, were supposed to be really energy efficient. And that was kind of a pilot project. They wanted to see if it actually made money or saved money. It was cost effective to do it on the whole campus. So they finished this parking structure, turned on the power. Parking structures all lit up. Great. They didn't notice an, an impact on their electric bill with that whole new parking structure full of lights. So the lights were so efficient that they didn't actually raise the energy bill for the campus at all. So now you're saving money. Now they're a little bit more expensive up front, but they also last 10 times longer than the normal light bulbs would have lasted. So you save that much more money in addition to your electricity bill. So the campus then took all the money that they saved on energy, put that into an account, and then use that account of savings uh, for more future projects. So you take that money and say, hey, let's put solar panels on our new parking structure. Those solar panels collect energy. Now you're not purchasing that energy from the Edison company. You're generating your own energy. Um, and so you're just making more money, and then you put that money into other projects, and you do a lighting retrofit of the whole campus because it turns out that parking structure was efficient. Let's put those efficient lights all over the school. So now you're saving, again, a whole ton of money doing that. And you just keep building in that way. So you start with one like simple money-saving thing. Uh, that campus is now producing too much solar energy where like Edison Company is kind of mad at them. Um, but like that, they're only mad because Edison Company is now not making as much money because the campus is not purchasing as much solar from them. So with solar panels, those are now extremely economically viable. Uh, solar and wind are now cheaper than coal. So like if you, nobody's building new coal power plants, but, but now there's, there's no economic reason to use coal instead of solar or wind energy. Questions about economic sustainability. Okay, what this also means is that um, all your business majors can get into this, come up with, with creative uh, marketing, marketing strategies, creative ways to pay for changes. If a place has to retrofit roads or uh, like raise that that uh, channel or the the road that you get into Humboldt State on. How do you pay for that? Why do you figure it out? How do you get money for that? Um, so economic sustainability is also means finding ways to pay for all these projects. Next aspect of sustainability. I'm going to call it social sustainability. Um, which is also kind of access. So money rules the world, and, and really like no big project happens unless it's funded well. Uh, people ultimately speak with their wallets. Uh, the only reason anything happens on Earth is because of, of economics. That's depressing, but it's true, and that's why half of you are business majors. Okay. The other way that things happen is, is by individuals. So social responsibility or, or sustainability and access to different programs. So social sustainability um, involves like the choices that you make. They have an impact. Um, things like, I don't know, choosing to, to use or to create less waste choosing to do individual things. But uh, this is second to economic because economic uh, aspects of sustainability have a greater impact than like a single individual. Um, most pollution is from major corporations, not from individuals. But we still make choices and that still matters. Um, other things to, or parts of social sustainability and access would be access to like public transportation. The United States is kind of unique 
and that our major cities are designed for, for cars, like single occupant cars to drive in. Um, that's why all of our campuses have parking issues because all these students take a single car there and the cities around them aren't designed for public transportation. Uh, if you look at any pre-industrial city, so it's most of the world except the United States, um, those major cities are all designed have for what kind of transportation? Trains. Mostly walking. Uh, but yeah, trains and bus and, and public transit too. That's kind of a trick question because I wrote it. But like pre-industrial cities are designed for walking because how do people get around? Maybe horse. If you're rich and you have a horse. Otherwise, walking. And so all these cities except ones in the United States um, are, are allow users, residents, individuals to walk around to, mo to meet most of their needs. And if you have to go someplace farther, then yeah, you take a train or a bus. Um, and so there's this concept within sustainability called walkability. So walkability uh, is a concept where you live in a walkable place, a walkable neighborhood, city, university, whatever. If you can meet your basic daily needs via walking. University of Baltimore did a study and found that the, the average distance that people were willing to walk was a quarter mile. So 0.25 miles means it's walkable. So if you can walk 0.25 miles, a quarter mile, uh, and meet your, like your basic daily essentials, then you're in a walkable place. Uh, most of, well, most of the United States is definitely not. Uh, as far as California goes, it really depends on the city. But like, if you pick a, a solid college town, a lot of college towns are walkable because students uh, typically have less money, prefer to walk. They're kind of centered around a campus. So like, if you live right next to PCC, it's pretty walkable. There's, I don't think there's a grocery store. Like, There's a 99 cent store that's kind of a grocery store. So you could walk to most places around this campus, a quarter mile. Um, but like, you know, if you're carrying a bunch of groceries, how far can you carry those groceries? The University of Baltimore says quarter mile on average is what people are willing to do. Uh, so there it is. But think about like certain neighborhoods. Uh, I grew up in Orange County. Irvine is kind of famous as, as a master planned community. People come from all over the world to the city of Irvine. Uh, it's got really good education system. Uh, it's the safest city in the country. Like, it's been ranked that many times. But it's designed for cars. And, like, usually the neighborhoods, if you wanted to walk, like, from your house to get to the street, it's a quarter mile to get out. And then once you're on the street, it's many miles to whatever store you wanted to go to. So it's, it's like, a, a purposely designed place to not be walkable. But that's also, like, the, the typical American suburb does not meet this definition by any uh, so, like, you at some point have a choice of where you live, uh, and sometimes this is important to people. Other people don't care about this. People that live in Irvine don't care about this. They're okay with driving everywhere. Um, and people that live in other places maybe chose to live there because of it. I, I live next to Cal State Fullerton because it's college campus, and I can walk to most places that I need. Um, other things that relate to social sustainability or access. Education. If you want people to make good choices, they have to be educated. Uh, you can make a whole bunch of changes. You can put out different trash cans and recycle bins. Uh, but if the people don't know how to use them, how to like actually throw away their waste properly, they're not educated on that topic, then they won't use them properly and, and your systems break. But overall, an educated public can come up to better solutions to our problems. If we have a bunch of negative effects of climate change, how do you solve those things? Make smarter people by educating them. Um, and then globally, the number one way to improve a society, like this is a long known thing that the UN has. The UN, if, if they want to improve a country or a society, you say, hey, we're, we're a de developing country. We ought to be better. Number one best way to do it is educate people and specifically educate women. Where if you educate women, 
then they manage their household better. And like around the world, that, that's kind of the normal thing where women typically manage the household and have a bigger influence on teaching their kids. So if you educate women, then you have educated kids too. They have better home finances. And, and like that's, if there was a guide to improving society, that's it. Just educate people, specifically women. That's all. Uh, and then things like healthcare. This one is, is almost <laughs> uniquely American. As far as developed countries goes, the United States is the only country that has healthcare problems like this. Um, where like you choose not to go to the doctor because of cost. That's a uniquely American thing if you live in a developed country. Questions? No? Okay. Yeah. Um, can education include uh, education about policies and stuff? Or? Totally, it, it should. Yeah, and this is kind of a, a lack in a place where our, our modern education system is lacking, where like the general public, even educated people, college educated people, don't have a solid understanding of politics, political processes, um, and even like basic finances. Like when you graduate, do you know how all of your student loans work exactly? No, probably not. Most people do not. Like statistically, no, most people don't. Um, and but you're an educated person. You took five math classes, but you don't understand the, the whole bunch of money that you owe. So uh, things like that, I, that should probably be implemented in like a college one thing is is like personal finance or like how do you buy a home? Should you buy a home? We're not that educated on on those topics for having a pretty well educated society. Is that kind of what you're asking about? Yeah, and also just uh, like environmental policies regarding like laws on um, environmental. Stuff. Yeah, that's a that's a good one too. So, like with this, there's actually a push by um, the CSU, absolutely the UC system, and the, the the community college system is is kind of less cohesive than like Cal State's and University of California. But both the Cal States and the UCs are trying to integrate sustainability into all education across the board. The Cal State system uh, wants every single student that graduates from the CSU to have a basic understanding of, of sustainable policies, um, best practices, and then to also have done like hands-on science activities using uh, sustainability as a topic. Uh, so, some places are, and, and like that system's not fully implemented yet, but that's a goal, and that's a pretty good goal. Um, I can't speak about other education systems, but like the CSU has that, at least. Others. Okay. Um, yeah, all right. Other aspects to sustainability. Guesses? Those are kind of the two non-obvious ones. Let's do waste, because I like waste. Waste. Um, waste is expensive. Waste is taking resources and not using resources responsibly. Like, it's throwing away resources, really. Um, the way that most Americans think about waste is with the uh, three R's. What are the three R's? Reduce, reuse, recycle. Cool, okay. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, those are actually in order of priority. Like that's an order of operations thing. This is like PEMDAS. You, you are supposed to first reduce waste, then reuse items, and then as a last resort, recycle. Um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the only one you ever really hear about is recycling because it's uh, really the only one that has like some economic impact. But recycling should be a last resort. Recycling is expensive. Uh, like you get some money doing it, yeah. But to recycle a single-use plastic water bottle, like that's a common thing that you recycle, that uses much more energy to recycle it than it actually took to create the bottle. It uses way more energy than the, the water bottle ever holds. 
Um, so recycling it is, is kind of a bad option is if it's a single use item. Um, if you recycle something, like okay, we have a recycle bin, where does that stuff go? You, you chuck a, where are you gonna put that? Trash. Oh, yeah, and that, that's actually kind of correct. So she's got a uh, boba cup, um, and and like that's that's actually a gap in here that I'll talk about specifically. Um, so that that probably could recycle. You could probably put it in the trash. In order for it to go in the recycling bin, it's got to be eighty percent clean. So now you have like, did you know that? No. Okay. So we're, nobody's educated on that. I just know that because my friend, who's also a geographer, works in waste management. Um, and told me like 80%. Okay, so is that 80% clean? Yeah, probably. So you could put that in the recycling bin, but then where does it go? So it goes to our sorting plant, um, and like our waste hauler takes it off, and, and people manually pick through and sort it. And so there's people on a supply line that, okay, cool, plastic, this goes in the plastic bucket, this goes in the metal cupboard. This is a straw, it's trash, we can't recycle straws. Uh, this is some other piece of plastic that we don't recycle. Uh, this goes in the paper pile. If paper is wet, you cannot recycle it. So that ends up in the trash if it's wet. Um, so there's all these things where even though you put it in the recycle bin, you do the right thing, you still can't recycle it because of reasons um, like being wet paper. And then where does it go? To actually recycle stuff, we don't do any of that here. We ship it, we used to ship it to China. China has started refusing our recycled materials because it's not economically viable for them. It costs too much energy, it's too wasteful, so they don't want them anymore. So now we just put them in the landfill. Now I'm not saying all, all the things that you put in the recycle bin go to the landfill. It might go get recycled somewhere, but there's also a solid chance that it goes to a landfill somewhere. Um, so like, what is the better option than all of that trouble? And like, okay, I want to recycle my cup. Let's <laughs> send it to China. Hope they fix the problem for me. I'll pay. Uh, well, it's way easier to just reduce the amount of waste you create. Um, instead of using single-use products, use reusable products. Um, now, with like Starbucks stuff, you get your Frappuccino cup, and like, and the Frappuccino cups like coated in caramel, right? And, the, and those are like the dirtiest pieces of plastic you can find. There's no way you're getting that 80% clean. So what's an alternative? Like, I don't want my cup all caramel covered and have to scrub it out later, so single use. So I don't know. Then I guess it's just a choice. And like, plastic straws. Uh, most of the time you don't need a plastic straw, but like, what do you do for boba? If you get a, like, there's the metal reusable straws now, and like, there's cardboard ones and stuff. But they don't make like, small gauge boba sized, they do. Re they do. Yeah. Okay. I've seen them. There's a tea shop in South Pasadena. Okay, so we, so we all need to go to Amazon and, uh, <laughs> and like order our... Yeah. yeah, okay. So they, they do have that now, because that was kind of the, the gap that was missing. But then for, like, transitory people like you who are students who drive here, is it hard to carry around a, a reasonable cup? No. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. It, it's kind of a, a personal choice that's also, like, a habit thing, where, like, if you wanted to... The, the real easy way to reduce waste, and like this is what I did for water bottles and plastic bags at the grocery store and like cups and stuff. So if you're trying to get rid of an item and you forget to bring your bag or your cup or your bottle from home, just don't have the thing that day of like, I forgot my bottle. Okay, you're not gonna die if you don't have water for a couple hours, you'll be all right. If you forget your bag at the grocery store, then, like, now the state of California makes you pay for it, so we're kind of forcing it economically, which is good. Um, but then just don't use a bag and, like, embarrassingly have a cart full of all your stuff and then just chuck it in your, your car <laughs> afterwards. Like, well, forgot my bag, guess I'm carrying everything in my arms afterward. Uh, so that's a really easy way to reduce waste. It's like, okay, I forgot my thing, guess I won't have it today. And then, like, two, two times of, of forgetting your thing you'll start remembering it. It's like, yeah, I wanted water. I was thirsty and that sucked, not having a cup. Yeah. I have a question. So what happens when all the stuff is in the landfill? Do they just pack something? Yeah, so landfills, landfills are, are things that um, 
can't be recycled, can't be reused. Um, and so a landfill is a, a, a big pit, and uh, dump trucks go there. Uh, each city kind of has its own section of landfill. Trucks drop their stuff in the landfill. Uh, bulldozers smooth it out, cover it with a layer of dirt and some other stuff to kind of insulate it in for gases and, and decomposition. And then they put the next layer of trash on it. And you, you usually start with like a big valley between two mountains and just fill that valley up with trash and turn the valley into a mountain full of trash. And there are landfills all over the place, like all over Southern California, all over LA. You might live very near a landfill. In uh, Brea, which is like North Orange County, the city above Fullerton where I live, there's a big old landfill in a mountain. You can see like there's mountains, it used to be a valley, I was there. Um, and like there's a mound of dirt that's there and a bunch of houses built right beneath it. Um, and those houses, the, the windows that are on the, like the north side that's next to the landfill uh, aren't allowed to open their windows because the, like, the gas is coming out. But like that's, you, we all live fairly close to a landfill. You do. You don't know it, and you probably can't smell it unless you're really close. Um, but they're, they're all over the place. And like they're getting more expensive because you know all, all the close land is is taken up by landfills already. Are they, people are they able to like burn and like melt? Well, into? so like yeah, burning trash. So there there's you know throwing your trash in a pile and burning. That's that's one way, and that's illegal here. But um, I think Sweden, I think Sweden, yeah, um, built a uh, electricity generation plant where they actually take their, their waste, their trash, their non-recyclable items, um, and they, they burn it in a contained environment that captures all the gases, and they actually use that to generate electricity. So that's super cool, and then the city, or the, sorry, the country, is so efficient in terms of waste that they don't have enough waste for the plant. So other countries are now paying them to burn their waste too, and then Sweden gets the electricity from it too. So they get money and energy for doing that. And I, like, yeah, it was probably expensive to build. But it sounds like they're making up the cost pretty quickly, and they found a really good thing to do with all their waste. And then Belgium came aside and they said, I, I watched them. I, I heard Minnesota and Oh, uh, I wouldn't be, I, I haven't heard about that, but Minnesota might be. I mean, if, if Sweden is doing it well, I don't know why everyone else isn't trying to build their own version of that, because that's a really good idea. Um, and, like, especially for the United States, because we love to use stuff and throw it away. Um, okay, so that's step one. Reduce. You should reduce waste. Yeah. Oh, you have a bag? Oh, no. What's this? Oh. Uh, you can buy a compostable and biodegradable single-use bag. So if you have to throw away dog poop or pears, um, you can buy bags for that. Good one. Yeah. Um, and then there, there's lately been a whole bunch of legislation uh, around the world, but in California too, that kind of forces people to not create waste. So state of Hawaii, I think, was the first state to ban plastic single-use plastic bags altogether. Uh, different cities in California have done it. And then actually the Cal State Systems uh, just in January banned all single-use plastics. So like the campus has a couple of years to figure it out, but all single-use plastics on, on every Cal State campus are banned, like starting now and in a couple of years. It's based in, yeah. How would you, um, I guess, recycle plastic? I heard it's really hard. It's really yeah. Really impossible. I... So, like, and, and this is probably better for, like, an, an engineer, like a plastics engineer person, but I assume you just get all the plastics. You have to sort them by, by like, weight and style, and so your every plastic thing has a little number on the bottom that says what type of plastic it is, and you put all the same plastics together in a big vat, probably, burn them and melt them down to uh, plastic, and then make new plastic stuff out of them. What do you do with all the, so I know you can't burn them. Well, the, so they don't like set it on fire, but they heat them up and melt them right. into more plastic. Oh, and then they, they uh, like they kind of spit out little plastic beads, and those plastic beads are then used to mold into new plastic items. So that's how you recycle plastic. Yeah. 
if you can't reduce waste, reuse things. Um, so okay, you have a you have a single use cup, you can reuse it. Uh, it's easier to just get you know like a, a cup, reuse it. Um, and then they're they're like the single use plastic water bottles. So hold hold that up for me. It's very well timed. Um, those ones are not meant to be reused. They're made out of really thin plastic. And I've had students say, well, I, I, okay, I use the single use, but I'm not that bad because I reuse it a bunch of times and I get more uses out of that. Those are thin plastic that are not meant to, to hold up over time. And so the plastic particles actually like fall into your water. And if you leave them into the sun and then it really leaches into the water and then you have plastic in your body and you get cancer from it. So you like for the environment, sure, reuse them, but for your body, you probably don't reuse them. So through all that, recycling really should be the last step. Um, like if you have to recycle something, that means you failed in the other two options. So what uh, most countries around the world are, are working towards today, instead of the three R's, because this is dated, and if you talk to any like older person that's been working in this a long time, a lot of the time they'll be focused on recycling and nothing else. Like, Talk to some hippies that are recycle, recycle, recycle. It's like, guys, it's, that's wrong. <laughs> that's the last option. So what people are focused on today, or should be, is called zero waste. Zero waste policies are where you try to take all the waste that you produce and reduce it to zero. So think of all the things that, that like your house throws away on a daily basis. Food stuff, I don't know, tissue, toilet paper, paper products, plastic packaging, all that stuff. And kind of step by step, remove all those waste items from your life, from your house, and get eventually to zero waste. Now that's really hard. It's easy to reduce some of those items, like single-use plastics, super easy to get rid of. Um, other things, I don't know, what else do you throw away? Toilet paper, well, that goes in the pipes and like you sh maybe you put it in the trash. Don't recycle toilet paper because that does not recycle. Um, that one's one of those things that you, you probably can't get rid of unless you're going bidet. Um, what else you throw away? Almond, Almond milk? Like the carton. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Just throw away almond milk. Yeah, so like, like uh, drink packaging, yeah. Um, and so those cartons are actually, they're not recyclable. It's paper on the outside. So you're like, cool, paper, recycle. Now they're lined in wax. You can't recycle that. Juice boxes are even worse. Like not that you drink juice boxes probably, but those are paper with foil and then wax. So the, they're extra not recyclable. Um, so all those things of like, okay, almond milk packaging, uh, you could, I guess, or, and, and that's not really something that we can do. But grocery stores could start having like a tap system. They've got almond milk on draft, basically. And like you get your jug of milk and you, or like your metal container, glass container, you bring it to the grocery store, fill it up, and then they charge you for like a gallon of almond milk. Almost like Sprouts does with its bulk, like granola stuff. Like we could do that. There are some of those.